My name is Dr. Julia Nepper, and today I'm going to be telling you about how to model a soil microbiome. So I want you to think of the adage, missing the forest for the trees. If you're not familiar with this saying, what it means is that you're focusing so intently on one particular aspect of something that you're missing the larger context. Now, I don't study trees. I study soil bacteria. But the underlying principle of understanding the larger context is part of what I study. There's another thing that you may not think of when you think about trees, and that's the soil and the roots. And there's another saying that's common, dumber than dirt, and I'm going to show you today that soil is anything but stupid. Far from being an inert mass of minerals, soil is actually full of life. There are larger creatures that you may be more familiar with, like moles and earthworms. But in addition, there are billions and billions of microorganisms. A single teaspoon of rich soil can have as many microorganisms, as many bacteria, as there are people in the United States. So hundreds of millions of bacteria per teaspoon. So what we're interested in doing with these bacteria is forming what's called a model system. Model systems are very useful tools for simplifying a problem and taking it to the lab and doing experiments with it that we can then extrapolate to a different, more complex system. One that you may be familiar with is the common lab rat, Rattus norwegicus domestica which we use as a model for understanding diseases in humans, as well as understanding rats. And one of the reasons why we're interested in this is because we can often find emergent properties when we look at systems in their entirety. So what this means basically is that the individuals together are greater than the sum of their parts. So you can think of, for example, a heart. Heart cells individually are not able to pump blood through our body, but if you get billions of them together, then you can form the organ, the heart, which has the emergent property of being able to pump blood. Now, I told you that I was going to talk about soil bacteria, but even that is a bit too large of a problem to tackle with just one model. So what I'm actually going to be talking about today is a zone specifically called the rhizosphere from the Greek rhizo meaning root. You can think of this as the plant root microbiome. It's basically the area of soil directly on and about a millimeter away from the roots. And this is the area of soil that's directly impacted by plants. One of the reasons why we're very interested in the rhizosphere is because of agricultural reasons. If we can directly affect the rhizosphere, then we can have effects on the plant that can cause them to be more drought resistant or to produce more fruit, etc. Another reason why we're interested in studying the rhizosphere is because it can affect plants' ability to take up carbon dioxide and form it into other carbon compounds which it uses to build itself. So if we can somehow alter the rhizosphere so that the plants are better able to take up carbon dioxide then it's possible that we could have some beneficial effect on climate change. So I'm going to spoil the punchline a little bit, and I'm going to tell you what the model system is before I tell you how we got there. It's called THOR. Not the one you're thinking of. It stands for the Hitchhikers of the Rhizosphere. And it's a model system composed of three different bacteria. Pseudomonas coriensis, Flavobacterium johnsonii, and Bacillus cereus which I will refer to as PK, FJ, and BC. So the first question, of course, is how did we create this system? How did we get here? Well, this started with some agricultural research, in fact, about 30 years ago, where researchers were trying to find biological agents that could control diseases of alfalfa, as opposed to chemical agents like pesticides. The way they went about this is by isolating bacteria directly from the roots of the alfalfa plants. You can see the results of an example isolation from roots. We get all of these individual colonies, which are themselves 
propagations of an individual species or strain of a species. So then we can select those colonies and use them for further analysis. So the researchers isolated 700 different bacteria from the roots of alfalfa. But they only found one that was able to prevent the disease that they were looking at, and that was BC. But there was an issue when they actually took it back to the field and tried to apply BC to fields of alfalfa to prevent this disease. And that was that it was only somewhat effective, sporadically effective. And so they decided, well, let's look at what the larger context is of what this BC is existing in. So one thing that's really interesting about BC is that it carries what's called biological hitchhikers. We're not exactly sure why it does this, but it could be because these bacteria are using BC to get somewhere or using it for nutrients or something like that. So basically what a biological hitchhiker is, is you will isolate the bacteria from roots as before, and then you will take the individual colony that you're interested in and you will attempt to purify it. So you'll passage it on media a bunch of times until it looks like you just have that one particular bacterium. And then you put it at the fridge for a couple days and you come back to it and suddenly there's a new species there. There's a new bacterium that's growing with what you thought was just BC. So then we can take that species and we can re-isolate the BC and isolate the new species and we can start to characterize both of them. One hitchhiker that's very common on BC is FJ. And it seems that the reason for this is because FJ actually uses BC to be able to survive in the rhizosphere. So to imitate the rhizosphere environment in the lab, we use what's called root exudate medium. So plants secrete a lot of molecules from their roots all the time. And root exudate is composed of things like sugars, organic acids, and other small molecules. So we take that and we make it into a medium in which the bacteria can grow. BC grows just fine in this medium, but FJ does not. So in the graph on the right, on the vertical y-axis, what we're looking at is the number of FJ cells. And on the horizontal x-axis, we have different concentrations of cell wall fragments. So BC will actually shed parts of its cell wall into the medium and this is what actually feeds FJ. So you can see that as we get higher concentrations of cell wall fragments, or on the rightmost bar, if we simply add BC, then FJ is suddenly able to grow in this medium, indicating that it's the cell wall fragments that are feeding FJ in this medium. There's another hitchhiker that's of particular interest to us in the lab, and that's PK. Interestingly enough, PK actually inhibits the growth of FJ and other co-isolates that are closely related to it. So in this graph, again on the vertical y-axis, we have number of bacterial cells. And that's not just of FJ, it's of whichever isolate is labeled on the bottom. And then on the horizontal x-axis, we have the different co-isolates, and I've highlighted FJ for ease of viewing. And then on the right, BC isn't a hitchhiker, but we're just using it for comparison. So the blue bars are showing the amount of growth that you get with these isolates when they're in isolation. And then the orange bars are showing the amount of growth that you get when you add PK. And you'll see that there aren't any orange bars, except in the case of BC, because PK actually kills all of FJ and its closely related co-isolates. So it was clear to us that these three species were interacting in nature and interacting in interesting ways that you wouldn't expect if they were just strangers in the night passing each other. So the next question that we wanted to ask after we established the system is how do these bacteria interact? We need to characterize our system so that we can use it better. So one of the first things that we noticed is that BC actually prevents PK from killing FJ. 
So when we grow FJ in isolation in the blue line, again, it reaches a certain level, as you can see on the vertical y-axis, which is indicating the number of cells of FJ. But if we add PK in the red line, then you can see that over time, as indicated on the horizontal x-axis, PK will completely kill all of the FJ until FJ is no longer detectable. But if we add BC to this mixture, so we have the full three-member community in one tube, then FJ is able to grow just fine, perhaps even slightly better than it would grow on its own. And we found that the reason for this is an antibiotic set of molecules called coriensins that are actually produced by PK in response to the presence of FJ. But when we add BC, then BC prevents the production of these coriensins by PK, allowing FJ to live. There's another really interesting phenomenon that occurs with the three-member community, and that's in biofilm formation. So biofilms are multicellular communities of unicellular organisms. Something that you may be familiar with that is a biofilm is rock slime in a pond or a lake. So a biofilm is the cells themselves and then a matrix of sugars and proteins and other molecules that the organisms secrete to keep themselves protected and together. So in the right image, you can see a biofilm composed of the three organisms with PK labeled in blue, FJ in red, and BC in green. And you can see that they're kind of stably associated with each other. And the way that we measure this in the lab is by growing these cells in what's called a 96 well plate, pictured on the left. And then after a certain amount of time, we wash out any cells that are not adhering to the surface and thus presumably not in the biofilm. And then we can stain whatever material re remains with what's called crystal violet. And this is like the most exciting part of my week because most of the things that I do in the lab are with clear colorless liquids. And so doing something that's purple is actually pretty great. So then once we've added the purple dye, we can shoot light through each well and based on how much light passes through, we have an indirect measure of how much biofilm there is. So I was interested in studying this phenomenon when I came to the lab because I studied biofilms when I was a graduate student. And one thing that we wanted to know is why this was happening. So BC and FJ both cause PK to form more biofilm. So on the vertical y-axis, we have um, measures of biofilm versus time on the horizontal x-axis. And in the blue line, we have just PK itself forming a biofilm. It forms a certain amount, and then over time, that drops off as the biofilm begins to disperse. Then all of the other lines are PK plus either BC or FJ, or both. And you can see that in all of these instances, PK forms more biofilm than it would by itself. So we wanted to understand why is this happening? And at least in the case of BC, it seems to be at least partly because of this other antibiotic molecule called sweatermycin that BC produces constitutively or all of the time. So we did a simple experiment where we grew PK with differing concentrations of the sweatermycin, which you can see on the horizontal x-axis. And you can see that when we get a certain concentration of the sweatermycin, then the PK biofilm formation almost doubles, as you can see on the vertical y-axis, relative to the level we reach without sweatermycin, indicating that perhaps Sweatermycin is not just acting as a killing molecule, as we usually expect for antibiotics, but it may also be acting as a signaling molecule, telling PK, hey, I'm around, let's make a biofilm together. So that's the hitchhikers of the rhizosphere. Two bacteria that hitchhike on this agriculturally relevant bacterium, Bacillus cereus. 
I've shown you that these bacteria seem to interact in the real world. So BC feeds FJ parts of its cell wall. FJ causes PK to produce coriensins, which in turn kill FJ. BC reduces coriensin production by PK, allowing FJ to cohabitate with the other two. And the zwittermycin produced by BC enhances the biofilm produced by PK. And altogether, these three organisms form more biofilm than any of them would on their own. Now this is a lot to remember, and I don't expect you to remember all of these different phenomena that I've shown you today. But what I would like you to remember is that these bacteria communicate with chemicals, like many other bacteria. So we've seen coriensins, which have a certain effect on these different bacteria, and zwittermycin, which have a certain effect. But there's also many more chemicals that we haven't yet identified that govern the interactions between all of these bacteria and bacteria in general. So what we're interested in studying next is how does this model system actually interact with plants? Because if you remember, the rhizosphere is the plant root microbiome. So of course, we don't wanna just understand how the bacteria interact with each other. We wanna know how they actually interact with the plants. So in this image, we can see a plant root tip that is being colonized by BC, which is shown in green. So examples of questions that we might ask next are, how does adding PK or FJ affect BC's ability to colonize a plant root? Does it change the way in which uh, BC colonizes plant roots? Does it change the way in which BC affects the plant growth, etc.? And all of this is so that we can identify basic principles of how microbiomes function. Not just for understanding plant microbiomes, but also hopefully to understand human microbiomes, cow gut microbiomes, and all of the microbiomes that surround us constantly. And specifically, we want to understand how these organisms interact. Because again, nothing in exists in isolation. There is not just a tree. There's always a forest that we have to consider. Thank you.